Hello and assalamu alaikum everyone. I am Kashif Kampran. A very warm welcome to Advanced Audit and Assurance Webinar to Success Day 3 for exams in September 2022. Now just before starting the proceeding of the Day 3, let's first look at the agenda and also a recap of the Day 2 which is important for the reinforcement of the learnings you got from the day to yesterday. Now, in terms of investigation today, uh, I will still be in the mock exam on the day three, and I will be investigating the question number two of the mock exam. So we are entering the section B of the paper. Today, the question number two, and on the final day tomorrow, day four, the question number three. So section B comes in focus for today and tomorrow. <clears throat> Again, lots of discussion, not just the question two, lots of discussions on the sideline of the question number two. Again, the marking scheme. Again, the reinforcement of the professional marks. Again, the understanding of commercial acumen. Again, the understanding of evaluation and judgment. And again, the understanding of analysis and skepticism because these three skills will be available in section B. You will not be having the communication skill in the section B. That was something extra in the question one yesterday on day two. Okay, now just before starting the day three, let's take a recap of the day two. Now, I hope you all had a good learning from day two just to reinforce some of the key learnings from the day two. Number one, it is very important that the first question of your paper, uh, which is worth 50 marks, where 40 marks are technical and 10 marks are professional, you are reading the requirements of the partner very carefully in the email. And you're looking at the signpost of the partner very carefully, what your partner don't want you to do. Because if you are doing something which the partner do not want you to do, you are losing the professional marks on communication. Now, just yesterday, we saw that the partner was mentioning in the email that the partner do not want you to consider the deferred tax consequences of a share-based payment. Now, if any student do consider that, uh, you will be losing your professional skill marks for communication because that was something against the partner request. So you need to be very careful of the signpost. Uh, then you exactly need to see what the partner wants in the requirements of the question. More importantly, the statement of materiality from the partner, that partner would like the materiality to be based on profit and writing the uh, opening paragraph on materiality concluding what level of materiality will you be using for profit because the range of profit is 5 to 10 percent so in that range of 5 to 10 percent what will be the conclusion uh, is it a new client is it a recurring client has there been any dramatic changes over the last year has there been any significant changes over the last year and then deciding which level you should be keeping because it's a it's not the first year audit you cannot keep it at the lowest level. If it is the first year audit, you will definitely keep it at the lowest level, which is 5%. But if it is not the first year audit, you are not keeping it at 5%. You're keeping it slightly higher than 5%, looking at the circumstances presented in the case. But again, that's your conclusion. And that's where you are getting the professional marks for evaluation and judgment, apart from the technical mark for calculating and commenting on the materiality. <clears throat> We did conclude that every risk you write is fetching you three marks. Uh, every risk which has an accounting treatment, every risk which is around the accounting treatment is fetching you three marks. Uh, the risk like risk of management bias, the risk like detection risk uh, will still fetch you two marks. So if you are working around the accounting treatments with materiality or without materiality, you are still fetching three marks. Now, because you have professional marks uh, and that, that ensures that wherever possible, you comment on the materiality. Wherever possible, you comment on the materiality because that is not just fetching you the technical marks. Don't just look at that the materiality marks is just three. That is technical marks. But if you are calculating and commenting on the materiality beyond the three technical marks, you're still fetching the professional marks because it's part of evaluation and it's part of judgment. So try to uh, 
do materiality wherever possible in the question. Try to find uh, trends, try to find increase and decrease, try to connect that with your answer, try to find calculations wherever possible, try to connect that with your answer, try to absorb the case study. The, I think the critical success factor for professional marks come down to one point. And that one point is your connection with the case study. If any student has a strong connection with the case study, you are trying to write an answer within the boundaries of the case study. You understood very well what is happening in the case study. You, you exactly know what's happening in the exhibit one, two, and three before you start writing the answer. You exactly know what is happening in the financial numbers and you can connect the financial numbers with the statements of management. You can argue uh, if the management if the management is saying something about revenue, you can you can correlate revenue with the number of revenue. Is the revenue rising? Is the revenue falling? Is the management talking about something about operating expenses? You can correlate operating expenses with the numbers of operating expenses. Is it rising? Is it falling? You need to be you need to involve yourself in the case. You need to connect yourself with the case. And more importantly, you need to exercise proper judgments wherever possible. And you need to ensure wherever the management is giving a statement. If the management is saying we are not conducting an impairment review, be skeptical. Challenge. Challenge the statement of the management that an impairment review is required. Why are you not doing it? It is a requirement of ICE 36 that you should test the asset for impairment every year to conclude whether the impairment is required or not to determine the recoverable amount. If the management is saying we have estimated something like the share-based payment expense yesterday, the management was estimating that. So even though the treatment was right, they were recognizing the expense, but that was an estimated expense. So you should challenge the estimate. You should ensure whether the estimate has taken the right fair value. Is the fair value taken at the grand date? That is very important. And is the management assumption of all options will vest is right or wrong? Because if the management assumption of vesting is wrong, then the expense automatically becomes wrong. So wherever you find management opinions, management statements, wherever you find management telling you something, you need to argue, you need to challenge, you need to be skeptical. So please ensure whatever we have done in the question one yesterday uh, in terms of reading, brainstorming, writing, the suggestions I gave you yesterday, you have just reinforced them and you have just... Uh, implemented them when you are practicing more questions at home. So try to improve the quality threshold of your answer, which is the much needed thing for the upcoming exams and ensure the incremental time you have for every technical mark, you do justice to that. So instead of having 1.95 minutes per technical marks up to the June exams, now having something like 2.44 minutes per technical mark, the incremental time is demanding something from you. So I hope you agree with this uh, recap. Uh, more importantly, the procedures. I did demonstrated procedures yesterday. I did copied the paragraph of share based payment and I investigated the paragraph of share based payment to find my procedures. Again, the Defertex asset, you have to investigate the paragraph of Defertex asset to find the procedure. You're not writing journal procedures on Defertex or journal procedures on share based payment. You need to look at the situation given and then adapt your procedure. If your procedures are adapted, they will become reasonable procedures. You will be demonstrating evaluate, you will be demonstrating analysis and more importantly, commercial acumen because acumen means a sound knowledge of the business. So if you are linking everything to the case, and if you are trying to blend your answer with the case, that means commercial acumen, because you are taking the know-how of the case study. And if the know-how of the case study is implemented in your answer, that definitely means the commercial acumen in the question number one. I hope you're all clear and sound on this recap. Can you just confirm? So we proceed to the agenda for day three then. Is everyone clear with this recap? Is everyone sound with this recap? If you missed out something yesterday, I hope this recap would have benefited you. Okay, that's great. Okay, now just moving on towards the third day agenda where we are looking at the question number two from the 
mock exam. So a look inside question two of the September 22 mock exam on the practice platform and learning from it. Now the mock exam, question number two, we know that we decided this on the day one of the webinar, that section B of the paper will consist of one question from syllabus area E, and that is default. So one of the question in section B has to be from syllabus area E, right? And you know what syllabus area E is, which is the completion and reporting stage. The other question in section B can be from syllabus area A, B, C, or F. And the higher chances is from F. F is a dominating syllabus area in one of the question of section B. But you can still find questions from syllabus area A, B, C in one of the question in section B as well. But F is a popular area known as other assignments. Now, if you have practiced plenty of past papers, you must have seen questions on due diligence. You must have seen questions on forensic audit. You must have seen questions on review of prospective financial information. And there is a new article, right? The assurance on social, environmental, and sustainability information. And particularly the part two of that article is an other assignment, is an other, is an engagement a separate engagement. What if a question comes on the part two of the article this time in your September actual exams, examiner asking, examiner giving you a situation where the management wants you to give an assurance on social, environmental and sustainability information as a separate engagement. So that will also impact the syllabus area F this time. And I hope you're all ready for that. I've already covered the video, shared that with my regular students and my journal students who follow me on the social media. Okay, let's start a look inside question two. So this time the question two was from the syllabus area F. So examining team again focused on the syllabus area F for making the question two of the mock exam. And it's a very popular area with your examining team, right? And the question was set on prospective financial information. And this is the most popular other assignment uh, with the AAA examining team. Lisa Weaver and the Lisa Weaver examining team loves this topic. And a lot of questions have come in the past paper on prospective financial information. What was there in the question? There were three parts to the question A, B, C. I'll just show you that on the practice platform. The question was asking you matters in agreeing the terms of engagement. Now, I will be telling you there is a big difference, right, uh, in matters in agreeing the terms of engagement and matters in deciding whether to accept the engagement or not. You know there are two questions which comes in past paper. One question which is perhaps more regular and more popular is matters in deciding whether to accept the engagement or not or matters in deciding whether to accept a new audit client or not. Now, this is not that question. This is a question asking you matters in agreeing the terms of engagement. Now, the terms of engagement is something you know as an engagement letter. Terms of engagement, engagement letter. We know every engagement starts with a letter. And in that engagement letter, you put the terms to avoid misunderstanding because those terms are explicit and will avoid any misunderstanding between the management and the auditor. So examiner is not asking you whether you should accept this engagement. No, examiner is asking you the matters in agreeing the terms of engagement. Which terms will you agree and put in the letter? So there is no misunderstanding between you and the management. So this was the first part. Second part was about procedures. We know uh, for other assignments, whether it is review of prospective financial information or it is due diligence or it is forensic audit, Examiner is very fond of asking procedures. Even in the new article, Assurance on Social, Environmental, and Sustainability Information, procedures are part of examiner article. And you better cover that uh, rather than regretting if a question comes in the actual September 22 exams. Last good thing, implication for assurance report. Now, examiner recently has started to ask something about the assurance report. We know a question comes on audit report. Examiner do ask you impact on the audit report. 
uh, this is not the impact on the audit report. This is the impact on the assurance report, assurance report for PFI, assurance report for prospective financial information. And we know the prospective financial information is a moderate assurance, negative assurance, limited assurance. So what will be the implication for the uh, report on PFI? Now, there must be something wrong in the question. And the examiner is asking you, what is the impact of that wrong thing on the report on PFI? So examiner did ask you an implication for the report for four marks. So this question was technically of 20 marks because five were professional marks. So out of 20 marks, four marks were allocated for the implication for assurance report. I will be covering each part and guiding you in terms of knowledge, marking scheme, and every other aspect. Let's start proceedings. Let's start looking at the question two on the practice platform. Let's understand, drill, and conclude it. Yes, exactly, Rahul. Now, before you think about the implication, you will look at what is the issue, and then you decide what's the conclusion on the assurance report. Okay, is everyone ready, set? Let's start the proceedings. Let's go on and start with the practice platform. Okay, can you all see the practice platform in front of your screen? Please confirm that. Okay, so you can see the practice platform, right? That's great. Okay, now let's start things up. Now, you know that again, just like the question one yesterday, you will first quickly read the right hand side of the screen in just like one minute. You have 12 minutes of reading and planning time for the question number two, which is quite a lot considering the, the question is not very lengthy and you have 36 minutes of the writing time. So this is quite good enough looking at the length of the question we get in section B. Now, let's quickly read the screen on the right. It is the 1st of July. You are a manager in Davis & Company, which is the audit firm. A firm which offers a range of services to audit and non-audit clients. So the firm is very competent, right? They're not just offering the audit services, but they're also offering the non-audit services. So it's quite a diversified firm and a good firm. You have been asked to consider a potential engagement to provide assurance report on prospective financial information to the Amundsen company and existing audit client. So you have been asked to provide a report on the Amundsen company and existing audit client. So you are considering this potential engagement uh, to report on the prospective financial information of an existing client. The audit of the financial statement for the year ending 31st of May 20X5 has just commenced. So you have just commenced the audit, but along with audit, you have got another request from the management and the management would like you to provide an assurance on the prospective financial information alongside the audit. That's the introduction. The following exhibits are available. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the three exhibits. The first exhibit is about the, the company itself, the Amundsen company, information regarding the Amundsen company and review engagement your firm is invited to provide. The forecasted financial information is given in the second exhibit. And the third exhibit contains update following the engagement procedures performed on prospective financial information. So there are three exhibits on the left, which we will be reading. So the basic thing we're getting to know from this opening paragraph is, that we are about to provide an assurance on prospective financial information to our existing client. The audit of the financial statement has just commenced and the let's see what we need to do. We'll immediately open the word processor because we need to write the answer. And we just narrow down the word processor so we can fit the window number two. Again, I'm just putting off my camera so we can have a better interaction. So you open the word processor on the right-hand side of the screen. 
Now you choose the heading number two to write the answer because that's a big font size. And you open the requirements first because we'll first copy the requirements on the word processor and then start connecting the requirements with the exhibit one, exhibit two, and exhibit three. It is a good practice to read requirements first right before you read the case, just like we did yesterday. We first put the requirement in the briefing note and then started writing the answer. Let's open the requirements. Okay, here are the requirements. Let's put the requirements on the left-hand side of the screen along with the word processor. Now I'm just copying the requirements A, B, C to my word processor. And I'll write over here, answer to question two. And I'm just copying the requirements. Requirement A, requirement B, and requirement C. Now just do a quick analysis before I read the case study. I'm just closing the requirements. Okay. Answer to number A, using the information in exhibit one. So for the requirement A, I just need to use the information in exhibit one, not in any other exhibit. Identify and explain the methods that should be considered in agreeing the terms of engagement, not the methods in deciding whether we should offer this service to our existing client. Now tell me, is the question asking you whether we can offer this service to an existing client? Is, is that the question? No. That means the question is not asking you whether you can offer this service or you cannot offer this service. The question is asking you something at uh, something different. The question is asking you methods that should be considered in agreeing the terms of engagement. Does that mean that we have accepted the engagement? Tell me, all of you. Does that mean we have accepted the engagement because we are considering the matters and deciding the terms of engagement? If, 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 we, if the question is asking matters that should be considered in agreeing the terms of engagement, that means we have accepted the engagement. We are just formalizing the terms, Rahul. We are just formalizing the terms on which there should not be any differences. If we are accepting the engagement and the examiner asks you matters you should consider when you are accepting the engagement, we consider the fees, the scope, the deadlines. We consider whether we can offer this service. Do we have competence? Do we have resources? Is there any ethical threats? We are not considering such things, right? We are not considering whether we have competence. We are not considering whether we have any ethical issues. We are not considering whether we have resources. The question is asking matters that should be considered in agreeing the terms. When you write the engagement letter, you write the engagement letter after you have accepted the client or before? Tell me, because Rahul was a bit confused. When, when, you write, uh, when you write the terms of engagement, before or after accepting the client? After. So what, what exactly happened to you, Rahul, when I asked the first question? I hope you're clear on this now, right? Okay, great. Let's, let's move back. So in the first part, we need to identify and explain the matters in agreeing the terms of engagement. How many marks we have for that? Six. Well, look at the marking scheme, right? But we just need to use the exhibit one. No other exhibit should be used in the answer. So you will not get the information from exhibit two and three. You just look at the exhibit one and draft the answer for six marks. So that's one requirement. The second, using the information in exhibit one and two, so for the second requirement, we have to use the information in exhibit one and two, both. So is that important that the examiner tells you yesterday in the question number one and today in the question number two, that which exhibits to use for which requirements? At times, the examiner also tells you using all exhibits. That is also a terminology, right? Should you follow the instructions of the examiner? Should you follow the instruction of the examiner which exhibit formulates the answer for which part? Is, is that extremely important? So using the exhibit one and two, design the procedures which should be performed in the examination of the forecast financial statement. So you need to design the procedures on the forecasted financial statements for 10 marks. So your focus is on procedures for 10 marks. And we know the marking scheme for procedure is one mark per procedure. So procedures, and that means one is equal to 10 procedures. So we need to write 10 procedures for the B part using the information in one and two. Okay, last, using the information in exhibit three. So just the information in exhibit three, right? 
not in two, not in one. So exhibit three, discuss the implication for the assurance report. What is the impact on the report assuming no revision will be made to the forecasted financial statement? So I believe in the exhibit number three, you have some dispute with the management and the management is not revising the dispute. And whenever you have a disagreement with management and the management is not revising that disagreement, you need either to put a qualified opinion or an adverse opinion, depending upon whether the matter is material or material and pervasive. Is that last part clear to all of you? So no revision will be made to the forecasted financial statement. So it seems like you have a dispute with management. So exhibit one for the part A, exhibit one and two for the part B, and exhibit three for part C. Now, implication for the report, if you remember the marking scheme uh, for audit report, implication for the report is worth one mark per valid point. So you're writing four points in your answer to wrap up the part C, four points in your answer. Okay, the first one, identify and explain the matters. Which matters? Agreeing the terms of engagement. Now, the matters to agree the terms of engagement is worth two marks each, is equal to you're writing three matters in your answer from exhibit one, not from any other exhibit. If this question would had been on whether, explain the matters that should be considered in whether to accept the engagement, then the marking scheme would have been one mark per meta. Please be very careful. Listen to me very carefully and tell me, have you got this message? The question is asking you matters in agreeing the terms, two marks per term. But if the question was something different, which we used to see in the past papers, matters in deciding whether to accept the engagement. Is, is that a different nature of a question, everyone? Matters to decide in considering whether to accept the engagement? Is that a different question? Yes. So the marking scheme of the matters then would be, the marking scheme of the matters then would be one mark per meta, right? where you consider the competence, where you consider the resource, where you consider the ethical issues, right? That, that nature of question, which comes a lot in the past paper. But over here, the marking scheme is two because the matters are different. The matters are in agreeing the terms of engagement. So reading the question, understanding the question in the first two to three minutes, you have total 12 minutes, right? Of a reading and planning time. But if you spend three minutes of reading the requirements, breaking the requirements, is that something which can enhance the quality of your answer? Is, is that something which enhance the quality of your answer? Right? So we know which exhibit to use for A, which exhibit to use for B, which exhibit to use for C. So in, now you have formulated the answer. Okay, we'll start writing with A, B, C, and we'll remove the requirements, right? This is just a rough sketch. So when you start writing the formal answer, your headings will become A, matters in agreeing terms of engagement. This is your proper heading, right? For in the exam paper. And once you complete the answer, you will remove the question from your word processor. For the second one, we need to write procedures, procedures in the B part. And in the C part, we need to write the implication for the report implication for the report and we just need to use the exhibit number three procedures we have to use the exhibit one and exhibit two and for matters in agreeing the terms of engagement we have to use the exhibit number one only right now you can simply remove the other things from the question once you're done with it right so examiner will just look at the heading a heading b and heading c and mark your answer. I'll just be removing the extra things once I'm done with the answer. Okay, let's start looking at the exhibit one. Matters in agreeing the terms of engagement. I'm opening the screen. Exhibit one. Okay, now this is the exhibit one, which we have to carefully read and understand. And from this exhibit one, we'll get the answer for the part A, matters in agreeing the terms of engagement. Okay. The 
Amundsen Company owns commercial real estate properties, typically comprising several floors of retail units and leisure facilities such as cinemas and health clubs, which are rented out to provide rental income, right? So that's the nature of business. They are they own the commercial real estate property. So that's the nature of the business and typically comprising of health and health clubs and cinemas. That's the opening paragraph. Second, your firm has just been approached to provide an additional engagement apart from the audit for the company to review and provide a report on the company's business plan. So you need to review and provide report on the company's business plan including the forecast financial statements for the 12 months period to 31st of May. So that's the scope, right? That's the scope which you need to agree. And you need to ask management that we are only expected to do this, not something extra. So management would like you to review and provide a report on the company's business plan, including the forecast financial statement for the 12 months period. You need to agree with management that are we responsible for both? Are we responsible for the business plan as a whole and the forecasted financial statement? Or are we just looking at the forecasted financial statement, not the business plan? You need to take clarity from the management because there can be some misunderstandings in the scope of the auditor. So auditor wants to be very explicit to agree the terms with management, agree the scope with management, that my scope is to review the business plan plus the forecasted financial statement? Or is it just one of them? And is it for the 12 months period or more than that? So is the management, give, is the management uh, like me to report on a forecast for one year or forecast for more than one year? You need to have clarity. See, misunderstanding. Why are we writing the engagement letter? We are writing the engagement letter to avoid the misunderstandings. Uh, so everything needs to be put in black and white. So that's number one. We'll come back to it shortly. Number two, the company is in the process of negotiating a new bank loan. And that for that reason, they need this forecasted financial statement to be reviewed, right? So what is the purpose of this forecasted financial statement? Once you give an assurance on this forecasted financial statement, will it be used by the bank? to give a loan to the company. So the company is in the process of negotiating a new bank loan of a $30 million. And the report on the business plan is at the request of the bank. So should we agree in the terms of engagement, the intended users, that is the bank, the only intended user? Will anyone else use this report apart from the bank? Because we need to be very clear about our liability as an auditor. Who will be using the report? Only the bank or someone else, right? So should we be concerned about the intended users apart from bank or is it only the bank? We should have a clarity on that. So the, the, uh, the assurance report by the auditor will be used to take a bank loan and the company is in the process of negotiating that. Next, it is anticipated that the loan will be advanced in 20X5. So we will get the loan in August 20X5 and would carry an interest rate of 4%. Now, this can help us to determine the finance cost when we are writing the procedures. Was the examiner telling us that you should use the exhibit one and two for procedures? So can we use this to calculate the finance cost? We know the amount of the loan, $30 million. We know it will be advanced in August. And we know that the year end of the company is May. So the loan is coming in August, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. That is for 10 months. So can we calculate the finance cost for 10 months and agree what the finance cost has been taken by the management? So this can become part of our procedure, right? The next one, the report would be provided by your firm business advisory department and an engagement quality control review will be conducted, which will reduce any threat to objectivity to an acceptable level. So see, examiner is not asking you to comment on the matters whether to accept this engagement. The engagement has already been accepted and you have decided that this will be offered by the business advisory department of your firm and a quality control review will be provided just to ensure that any self-review threat or any familiarity threat arising out of this engagement is reduced to an acceptable level. So when you are agreeing the terms of engagement, you are just agreeing the terms where there can be misunderstanding between you and the management. 
Last paragraph. The company is planning to invest the cash raised from the bank loan in a new retail park, which will be developed jointly with another company. So they want to develop a new park, which will be developed jointly with another company. So it seems like a joint venture. The Le Lazarev company and all the decisions about the new retail and leisure park will be unanimous consent of both the companies. So it is a joint venture, right? You want to make a new park and the bank loan will be taken as part of the new park. Investment will be made out of the bank loan. A lot of procedures can be made here. You can review the agreement between the two companies. You can agree the terms of uh, terms of business between the two companies. You can agree the bank amount. You can agree the loan of the uh, loan to the source document. You can recalculate the finance cost. A lot of procedures are coming from exhibit number one. But I think the terms of engagement in the whole exhibit number one are two. There are just two terms. Number one term is the scope that we are required to provide an assurance on the business plan, including the forecasted financial statement for a 12 months period. And number two is the intended user. We have to write a total of three matters, not two. So let's see how we get the third matter. Okay, I'm taking the first one, the first matter and the second matter here. Control C and I'm closing the exhibit number one and I'm taking it to my answer number A. I copy paste under A. This is what is being copied from the case study, right? Now let's formulate this into a six marks answer. The first one, you have to review and provide a report on the company business plan, including the forecasted financial statement for a 12 months period to 31st of May. That's number one. And number two is, the company is in the process of negotiating a loan of a $30 million and the report on the business plan is at the request of the bank. So that's number two. So at least my first term of engagement has to be my scope. My second term of engagement has to be the intended users. At least these are from the case study. I will write those points from the case study first before I, I write anything from the bookish knowledge. Now, whenever you agree the terms of engagement, you also agree the, resp the management responsibilities in your terms of engagement. That what are management responsibilities for preparing the PFI? Has the management used realistic assumptions in preparing the PFI? So you also agree the management responsibilities. You also agree the deadlines. You also agree the deadlines. You also agree the fees. These are all parts of terms of engagement. So in your terms of engagement, you agree the scope, you agree the intended users, you agree the management responsibility, you agree the deadlines, you agree the fees, and you also agree the assurance level. You have to agree with management that because this is a review engagement, the assurance level will only be moderate, not reasonable. What if the management is uh, misunderstanding the review engagement? What if the management has in mind that you will be providing them a reasonable assurance or a moderate assurance? So there are so many things, right, which comes under the terms of engagement. So anything which can cause misunderstanding. Can scope cause misunderstanding? Yes. Can intended user cause misunderstanding? Yes. Can management responsibility cause misunderstanding? Yes. Can the deadlines cause misunderstanding? Yes. Can the fees cause misunderstanding? You thought of a different fees, the management thought of a different fees, and the assurance level. But how many matters we need to write? On the screen, you are looking at six matters. How many we have to write for a six marks answer here? All six of them or just three of them? Just three. So which one should I prioritize? The one coming out of the case study? I ignore the scope, I ignore the intended user, and I write about deadlines, I write about fees, I write about assurance level, I write about management responsibility and wrap up my answer. Suppose there are six matters on your screen and there are two students writing the answer in exam and you need to fetch your professional marks as well. The student one writes the answer, scope, intended user, and management responsibility. At least two from the case and one journal, right? This is the answer for the first student. And there is a second student in the exam hall 
who is a more rote learn student, he says, okay, uh, I, I'll put deadlines, fees, and assurance level. Control C, and he brings the second one. Deadlines, fees, and assurance level. Which student answer is better connected with the case study? Which student answer is better connected with the case study in terms of the matters? Student one. So to get the professional marks, is it essential? Is it a critical success factor that the, the case is blended in your answer? If the case is blended in your answer, will that fetch most of the professional marks, including the commercial acumen? The commercial acumen means the know-how. So who is worthy of professional marks? The student number one. Uh, are both students worthy of the technical marks? Yes, both students will get the technical marks. But which student will get the technical plus the professional? The student one. So would you like to be student one or two in exam? I hope you're getting the perspective right. Try to find the situations from the case first. And if something is left, you can write it from the book knowledge. So I found the scope from the case. I found the intended user from the case. But I could not found the third point from the case. So I wrote the management responsibility. Is that clear? Just let's quickly write the answer. Okay, if I'm writing the answer for scope as the first point, I'll just take this from the question and I just rephrase it. I just rephrase this sentence I copied from the case study. The audit firm should clarify from the management, should clarify from the management of Emerson company should clarify from the management of the Emerson company as to whether the audit firm is responsible to responsible for providing responsible for the review is responsible for the re review of review of the company's business plan, including the forecasted financial statements for a 12 month period ending 31st of May 20X6, or only the review of prospective financial statements. The audit firm should clarify from the management of the Emerson company as to whether the audit firm is responsible for the review of the business plan, including the forecast, or only the review of the prospective financial information, full stop. So you should take clarity, even though it's given in the exam paper that you have to do this, but still misunderstanding can come in. So you should clarify your scope that am I responsible for both or one, full stop. Moreover, the audit firm should seek clarity that the period covered by the prospective, the period covered by the prospective financial information will be, the period covered by the financial, uh, forecasted financial uh, information will be 12 months only, not more than not more than it not more than this as it will affect the scope of the audit firm two marks right so you're seeking clarity from the client that the forecasted financial statements will only be for 12 months you will not later extend the forecasted period what if the bank requests you that we want uh, the forecast for 24 months and you change the forecast from 12 months to 24 months, you are taking a clarity that it will remain 12 months. It will not increase further. So the audit firm should seek clarity on the scope, what you should do and clarity on the time of the forecast. Is it just a 12 months forecast and it will not change further during the course of the audit. So that is the number one agreeing the terms of engagement, right? Number two, intended user. 
In terms of intended user, I'm taking the second point from the case study, which was about the intended user and try to rephrase that point. The bank, right? The audit firm should discuss with the management about the possible intended users of the assurance report on prospective financial information on assurance report on the prospective financial information and should ensure that only bank is the intended only bank is the intended user as the bank requested the as the bank requested the business plan for the for dispersing loan for disbursing loan. The audit firm should discuss with management about the possible intended users of the assurance report on prospective financial information and should ensure that only bank is the intended user as the bank requested the business plan for disbursing loan. Uh, knowing the intended users, knowing the intended users will help auditor, will help auditor with the liability and the amount of due care which should be involved in performing this engagement. So if there are number of intended users, you need to be very careful because that will increase the exposure to your liability. So you're just asking the company, is it just one intended user or more than one? because I need to be concerned about my liability. I need to be concerned about who can file negligence against me. And I need to exercise a greater due care for that. So point number two, point number three, management responsibility journal. The audit firm should agree with management that they are responsible for preparing and presenting the forecasted financial statements, including business plan, including business plan, full stop. Further, it should also be agreed that the assumptions used in preparing forecast by management are realistic and reasonable, realistic and reasonable in the context of the business environment, in the context of the business environment. So you're also taking an assurance from the management that the forecast is prepared by you and you are responsible for taking realistic assumptions in preparing the forecast. Auditor is not responsible for preparing the forecast. Auditor is not responsible to uh, develop the assumptions. Auditor is only responsible to review the assumptions, right? So that's the third part you're writing in terms of your answer. You can also discuss about fees. You can also discuss about deadlines. You can also discuss about assurance level. That's the remaining part of the answer you can think about. But you need six marks to wrap up this answer, which I've just demonstrated. Now, if I just look at the professional marks along with the technical marks here, and you go back to the requirements of the question, and you look at the last line here, professional marks will be awarded for demonstration of analysis and evaluation, professional skepticism and judgment and commercial acumen in your answer. Now, when you were asking management that is there any other intended user? Is there any other intended user? Were you demonstrating, were you demonstrating professional skepticism? When you were asking management, 
Is the forecast only for 12 months, not more than 12 months? Were, were you demonstrating professional skepticism, everyone? So when, when you are asking management, uh, is it more than 12 or is it 12? W was that the skeptical mindset of the auditor? When you were asking only the bank or someone else, was that the questioning mind of the auditor? So have you seen the questioning mind? Um, have you seen the questioning mind of the auditor in both cases? Right, so you are demonstrating that skepticism. Uh, is your first and second point coming out of the case study? Are you evaluating the first and second point out of the case study? So are you demonstrating the evaluation skills? Because evaluation means to evaluate something given in the case study rather than writing your own answer. Are you demonstrating the commercial acumen? Are you writing something out of the case? Your know-how of the case. The commercial acumen is taking, taking the answer from the exhibit number one from within the exhibit number one. So in your answer, there is a reflection of skills. There is a reflection of being skeptical. There is a reflection of being, uh, there is a reflection of evaluation. There is a reflection of commercial acumen. I hope you're all clear with that. So this answer is not just worthy of fetching you the technical marks, but there is uh, an opportunity for taking extra professional marks from this case. There are a total of five, right? And the five professional marks are divided in ABC. Look at the situation. You have just five professional marks and they are into ABC. Not necessarily all the five professional marks are in A. I hope you're getting my point. The five are diversified in ABC. You never know where are you fetching them. So it's not that you're fetching all the five in the first part. No, there are professional marks when you're writing the relevant procedures, when you're writing the good procedures. There are professional marks when you're writing the right implication for the assurance report. Is everyone clear with that? So the five professional marks are, are distributed among A, B, C. But at least in this answer, we demonstrated to be uh, we demonstrated skeptical mindset more than any other skill. Are you all clear? No answers coming from your side. Please confirm so we can proceed further. Okay, thank you for confirming that. But just, uh, I hope all other students are in clarity with what I just discussed with you in terms of the professional marks. No, please never write four points. Just write three points, the three best points, right? Prioritize the three best points rather than writing four points in a hope that examining team will, will check the fourth point, right? Thank you. Okay, just let's move back. We got the answer for A. We've done the exhibit number one. Okay, now we need to go down to the exhibit number two. And what was to be done in exhibit one and two? Okay, we have to use the exhibit one and two for writing the procedures now. Okay, so let's write procedures for 10 marks for from exhibit number one and two. Now, already in the exhibit number one, we got some information about what? Let's open the exhibit number one. We got some information about a new bank loan, which will be which we will get in August 20X5 and we'll carry the interest rate of 4%, control C, and we bring it down to the word processor as the first information. A new bank loan, we can recalculate the finance cost on a new bank loan. We can agree uh, whether we can agree from the correspondence of the bank whether the loan will be advanced in August or not. Have you got the loan? Have you got the loan or it, it will be advanced in August 20X5? Where are we standing? Where are we standing? The question said, it is the 1st of July. So we are standing in the 1st of July and the loan will be advanced in August. That is the future prospective. If a student says, review the loan agreement, that will be wrong. You can review the correspondence with the bank, right? To confirm the likelihood that the loan will be advanced in August. If the loan is not advanced in August, Rather, the loan is advanced in September. Will it affect the assumptions you took in the forecast? Tell me. Uh, I think uh, I just let's let one minute. 
if uh, I'm not answering a question, please put that question on the WhatsApp because my current focus is just to drill the question in front of your screen. Uh, if your question is important, uh, please put that on the WhatsApp uh, and I will be answering it in the next 24 hours, right? Thank you so much. Okay, now my question to all of you was, uh, if the loan is not advanced in August, because that is the assumption, if the loan is advanced in September or October, will that affect the other assumptions you took in terms of developing the new retail park? Will that affect your construction of the new retail park, the capital expenditure of the new retail park? So is it important to verify, will it be advanced in August or not? Is that a critical assumption? It is a very critical assumption, right? So not just the loan amount, not just the $30 million, which needs to be verified, but more importantly, uh, August is to be verified, right? And then the 4% interest rate, because if the interest rate is more than 4%, it will affect the finance cost. It will affect your forecasted finance cost for the next 12 months. And remember, we are looking into the future. This is not historical. Try to believe that. We are looking into the next 12 months, right? So that's very critical. Number one, let's see how we convert this to a procedure. Number two, exhibit number one. The Emerson company is planning to invest the cash raised from the bank in a new retail and leisure park, which will be jointly developed with another company. Okay, the, the new retail and leisure park will be developed jointly with another company. So we need to see any agreement for that. Uh, any formal agreement which must have taken place between the two companies. The two companies must have signed a memorandum of uh, understanding that we together uh, develop this park, right? So will there be any memorandums between the Emerson company and the Leather, Leather Riff company that we are in agreement to jointly develop this, right? The last one, all key decisions about the retail park will be unanimous consent of both companies, right? So we need to agree this from the terms of the agreement that the decisions will be taken unanimously. Plus, the decisions will be taken unanimously. So I think this is all I got from exhibit number one. The rest will come from the exhibit number two. So this is the information we got from the exhibit number one. Okay, just let's wait for one minute. Okay, is my voice clear now? Please confirm, is my voice clear now? Okay, thank you. And did you got uh, the copy paste I did from exhibit number one? Did you got the two bullets I copy pasted from exhibit number one? Everyone? Right, so now the remaining procedures will come from the exhibit number two, right? And we need to write how many procedures in total? 10. Now understand something critically. I'm just taking this requirement B on my Word file for a better analysis. So I'm just taking this requirement B on my Word file for the day three. I hope you can now see on the screen the Word file for day three. And we are doing the question number two of the mock exam for September 22. And I'm just copying the second requirement uh, we were doing right here, procedures, right? So I've just copied the procedure requirement here. And we just copied the exhibit one information here. Now, listen to me carefully. You need to write 10 procedures because you have 10 marks and a procedure is worth one mark. Examiner is asking you to write the examination procedures on the forecast, right? Now, if you have, practice plenty of past papers and you've seen the procedures on forecasted financial statements in the previous answers of the examiner. The procedures on forecasted financial statements are broken down into two categories, journal and specific. If you've ever seen the examiner answer, you can even see the examiner of this uh, examiner answer to this mock exam. Examiner has done the same practice journal procedures and specific procedures. But you cannot write more journal procedures and less specific procedures. You need to write less journal procedures and more specific procedures. So you have total of 10. 
So you can write two to three journal procedures, but six to seven has to be the specific one from the case study. Now, just to give you a relevance that the journal procedures for PF5, which you can also see from the examiner answer, is to cast, cast the forecasted financial statements to confirm the arithmetical medical accuracy. You will just cast the forecast. Two plus two is equal to four. So you are just doing the casting. One plus one is equal to two. So you are just casting the forecast. So there is no numerical error in the forecast. This is the journal procedure. Second, review the consistency of accounting policies used in preparing forecasted financial statements. Review the consistency of the accounting policies used in preparing the forecasted financial statements in line with, in line with the historical financial statements to ensure there is no change of accounting policy. So the auditor wants to agree that whichever accounting policies you were using whichever accounting policies you were using in the historical financial statements, the same accounting policies are used in preparing the forecast. And there is no change of accounting policy while you were preparing the forecasted financial statement. If there is any change of accounting policy, then the auditor will discuss the reason for that. And the auditor will ensure whether the accounting policy is right or wrong. So that is the second journal procedure. The third journal procedure is review previous results, re review previous results of forecast prepared by management with the actual results, with the actual results to confirm, to confirm, to confirm the realisticness of assumptions used by management. Uh, you can look at the previous forecast, right? The management has prepared. And you can compare the previous forecast with the actual results just to ensure how much variance comes in. If the variance is less, that means the credibility is more, the credibility of the forecasted financial statements. So review the forecasted financial statements previously prepared by the management with the actual results to confirm the realisticness of the assumptions used by management. So if there's, there, are, there are less variances, it is good. Finally, you can agree the opening balances used in the forecasted financial statements, like the opening balances of cash, the opening balances of receivables, the opening balances of assets and liabilities. Agree the opening balances used in the forecasted financial statements to uh, support documents like ledgers, etc., to confirm uh, accuracy, to confirm accuracy of the opening balances. So the forecasted financial statement starts from the opening balances, right? Of opening balances and the opening balances are what has been carried forward from the historical financial statement. And on those opening balances, you then forecast the future. So you can agree the opening balances uh, to the documents like ledgers, et cetera, to confirm the accuracy of the opening balances. Now these are four journal procedure. Agree the opening balances for assets and liabilities. Review the previous results of the forecast prepared by the management. Review the consistency of the accounting policies, third and cast. Now I can write six specific procedures and wrap up my answer. Yes, we can discuss the basis of assumptions uh, as a specific procedure, right? The specific assumptions given in the case study, Buffy. Is everyone clear with the journal procedures? Okay, let's move on to the specific one. What is the first specific procedure? New loan, new loan of a $30 million will be advanced in August 20X5. So can we review the correspondence between the company and the bank for the likelihood that the loan will be advanced in August? So my first specific procedure would be 
if I can just continue my numbering. Review the correspondence, not the agreement. Review the correspondence uh, from the bank to confirm the likelihood of the loan advancement in the month of August 20x5. Obviously, the, uh, there must be some ongoing negotiations, right? The question is telling us there is an ongoing negotiation. So there must be some correspondence which will confirm the likelihood that the loan will be advanced. What is the basis of management assumption? How is the management concluding that the loan will be given in August? There is some basis, right? The basis is the correspondence from the bank. No, see, agreement will only be formalized when the loan is dispersed. The loan will be advanced in August. How can the bank sign an agreement before dispersing the loan? Be logical, right? This is where you're losing the professional skill marks. How can uh, agreement be signed before getting the loan? Have you ever seen that realistically, practically in the world? Whoever is asking that question. So, when the loan is to be advanced, we can only have some we can only have some correspondences which at least conclude that the bank is willing to uh, the bank is willing to disperse the loan in August, right? So review the correspondence, right? Second, uh, agree the amount of loan to be advanced. That is dollar thirty million, and the interest rate of 4% from the ongoing correspondence, from the ongoing correspondence between the company and the bank. So there must be some ongoing correspondence like the emails. Check from the email, the likelihood of the loan amount, 30 million, and the likelihood of the uh, interest rate. You can recalculate the forecasted finance, uh, finance cost. Recalculate the forecasted finance cost. That is $30 million. Multiply by 4%. How much, uh, how much time will this loan be in the forecasted financial statement? We are getting this loan in August 20x5. And the forecast is for 31st of May, 20x6. So how many months? August to May, 10 months. No, the purpose of taking the loan is given by the company, right? You can confirm that from the board minutes. You can confirm that the loan is being taken for investing in the new retail park. And you can look at the joint venture arrangement between the two companies, that the two companies are jointly developing the park. So that will confirm the purpose of the loan, right? Uh, Tanjil, is everyone clear that this uh, loan is to be advanced in August and the forecasted period is 31st of May 20x6? So how much, how many months of finance cost we will be taking? How many uh, months of finance cost we will be taking? 10 months into 10 over 12. What is the answer? What is the answer? 30 million into 4%. 10 months, Rahul, the loan has been advanced in August 20x5 and the forecast is for 31st of May. So count, count the number of months from August to May. How many months are there, Rahul, from August to May? Are you clear, Rahul? Right, so that's, that's 10 months, right? Okay, 1 million. Has, every, has everyone confirmed that the amount of finance cost is 1 million? Thank you. Is equal to? dollar one million recalculate the finance cost recalculate the forecasted finance cost to confirm accuracy to confirm accuracy of the finance cost charged by management charged to confirm the accuracy of the finance cost forecasted by the management so if the management forecasted finance cost is one million and your recalculated amount is 1 million, that is very good. So the three procedures are coming out of the bank loan just in the exhibit number one. 
then the new retail park will be developed jointly with another company so new leisure park will be jointly developed with a new company with with, with another company sorry so you bring that into your next procedure number 8 new retail park will be jointly developed with another company so i will convert this to a procedure review review the agreement now there will be agreement here because the understanding to jointly develop has taken place before right the understanding to jointly develop has taken place before getting the bank loan so this must be an historical event the park will be make in future the, the park will be constructed in the future the loan will be the loan you will get in future but this understanding must have been reached as of the 1st of july so review the agreement between uh the between the company and the between uh sorry between both the companies between both the companies please name both the companies between both the companies i'm just not using the name of the companies to save my time review the agreement between both the companies to confirm the terms of arrangement to confirm the terms of arrangement and to ensure that the park will be jointly developed the park will be jointly developed and the decisions will be unanimously taken so all this will be confirmed from the agreement between the two companies right that will confirm things so review the agreement because this must be historical they must have signed the agreement by now and you proceed further right so that is eighth procedure writing the journal procedures and the specific just in the exhibit number 1 we are reaching a destiny of 8 versus 10 you open the exhibit 2 write another two procedures and you're wrapping up the answer just let's look at the exhibit number 2 quickly before we wrap up the answer okay i'm going back to the exhibit number 2 practice platform i hope you can see the practice platform on your screen we copied the information from the exhibit number 1 and we converted the information from exhibit number 1 to procedures i hope you like this way of organizing the procedures right so you took the information from the first exhibit you thought of converting that procedure to pro uh, information to procedure you are writing a case specific procedure and more importantly you are taking the professional marks of analysis and evaluation because you're writing a procedure which is reasonable realistic in the context of case but if any student write review the loan agreement you are writing an unrealistic procedure because the agreement will not be formulated because the loan is to be advanced in august so you need to understand the future tense not the past tense here because it's all about future let's open the last exhibit sorry this is the second exhibit in the second exhibit we have the forecasted financial statement i hope you can see that in front of your screen we have the forecasted financial statement for 31st of may 20x6 and that is the reason we took the loan for 10 months right okay now the revenue is increasing from 2600 to 25000 can anyone find the increase in revenue how much is the increase in revenue from the last year to the future can anyone find the percentage rise in revenue 2600 and 25000 can anyone find the surge in revenue quickly how much is the surge in revenue 21.4 percent. Okay, how much is the surge in operating expenses? How much is the surge in operating expenses? Can you find the surge in operating expenses too? The second line, 15. Okay, the operating expenses are increasing by 15, whereas the revenue is rising by 21 percent. So, even though both are rising, which is good, but you need to be skeptical as an auditor. to discuss with management that why the rise in operating expenses is lesser than the rise in the revenue there could be some understatements in the operating expenses right you are negotiating a bank loan and you want the fabrication uh, you want the fabrication of the results to get the loan so there is a possibility of an overstatement in revenue and an understatement in the operating expenses so can we discuss the reasons of uh, the significant growth 
when will we get the loan we'll get the loan in august what if we don't get the loan in august we get the loan in september you get the loan in august you start to develop the park the park will be constructed uh if the new park is constructed that means a lot of expenses coming in you must be taking uh, you must be uh, purchasing uh the new assets you must be purchasing a uh, new equipments for the park that means a lot of depreciation expense rising up uh, the depreci the forecasted depreciation expense will go up i hope you're getting my point so you need to be skeptical about the depreciation expense and the operating expenses you need to be skeptical about um whether the management is taking the depreciation expense rightly or not so these are skeptical mindsets right you need to demonstrate around operating expenses and discussing with management the reasons for the high rise in revenue considering in august you will get the loan then you will start to develop once the park is developed then you will get the revenue from the new park so uh, for example the park is developed in uh, january or february so from that point onwards you start to get the extra income or extra revenue so you need to confirm the basis from management when the park will be ready when the income from the new park will start to come in etc because i think the current park look at the note number here the note number tells us the current park belling belling retail is a retail park which is underperforming its sale is currently being negotiated so the current park is underperforming and the new park is to be developed now and you are expecting the revenue to rise by 21% considering one of your park is underperforming and you are all already negotiating the sale of the current park and the new park is the new park ready no the new park will take time to get ready so by when it will be ready from when the income will start to come from the new park so do you believe the 21.4% looks like a a bit unrealistic assumption can can we can we raise the issue on 21.4% I, i hope you're all getting it right next look at something unusual in this forecasted financial statement for revenue we have a comparative figure for operating expense we have a comparative figure for the finance cost we have a comparative figure look at the finance cost comparative figure how much finance cost we determined 1 million so if you add 1 million to 1690 it becomes 2690 right if you look at the finance cost you calculated it was 1 million so what 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 is the last year finance cost 1690 so you add 1690 plus 1 million it becomes 2690 and what is the finance cost the management is taking 2650 should we be skeptical about a possible understatement in the finance cost should we discuss with reason uh, what is the what is the difference of 40 or should we discuss the reason why 40 is less should we discuss this with management should we be skeptical will, will we get extra skeptical marks here right so wait wait for this right i'll i'll be writing it 40 less Okay look at the most unusual thing in the forecast which is not in the last year and the most unusual thing is 4720 this is the most unusual thing 4720 which is a profit on disposal of the underperforming park 4720 that number if you remove that number your profit before tax gets down So four seven two zero is a very very important assumption. You need to ask management uh, the basis of the profit. You need to ask management what is the likely sales proceed of this park. The park is underperforming, so you might not be getting a very good sales proceed. You need to ask management what's the sales proceed of this uh, retail park. Uh, what's the recoverable amount of this uh, retail park, or what's the fair value of this retail park? and its sale is being negotiated so can we look at some quotations to confirm the sales proceed its sale is been negotiated is it is it done tell me 
is the sales done or is it still negotiated so can we look at the quotations can we look at the quotations for uh, the estimated selling price to determine the uh, reasonableness of the profit has the profit materialized or is the profit forecasted the profit on disposal has it materialized or is it a forecasted profit it is a forecasted profit right assumption so what if the sales proceed assumption is wrong will it affect the profit on disposal definitely so let's wrap up the two procedures i just discussed with you uh, i'm going back to my word file and then wrapping up this question right in the ninth procedure please be with me i hope you got this procedure from my discussion um, analyze analyze the uh, forecasted growth analyze the forecasted growth in revenue that is 21.4% every calculation i do will that impress examiner to give me professional marks every calculation i do will that impress examiner to give me professional marks look at these calculations i've done to impress the examiner analyze the forecasted growth in revenue that is 21.4 percent and discuss <coughs> analyze the forecasted growth in revenue that is 21.4 percent and discuss reasons for such significant growth with management considering the existing park considering the existing park considering the existing park is underperforming and is put for sale and the new park is yet to be developed is yet to be developed right it it will take some months right you will get the loan in august so from august you will start to develop the new park you never know when the new park will be ready will, will it be ready in january 20x6 or in february 20x6 from that point onwards the revenue will start coming in so you're asking management what are possible reasons of such a high growth considering your existing park is underperforming and considering uh, the new park is yet to be developed you can discuss with management discuss with management the uh, discuss with management the timeline by when the new park will be developed will be developed the new park will be developed and the income from the new park will start to flow in discuss with management the timeline by, by when the new park will be developed will it be developed by the uh, by the end of the year beginning of the next year and the income from the new park will start to flow in when because that really affects the point number 9 do you believe the point number 10 the timeline has something to do with the 21.4% the timeline has to do something with the 21.4% so you need to be skeptical you need to challenge i hope you are getting the tone of challenging in my procedure i hope you find my procedure relevant to the case study i hope you find the calculations in my procedures i hope you find the percentages in my procedure is that making my procedures worthy of very significant number of professional marks out of 5 right further you can review the quotations review the quotations from the potential buyer look at my terminologies i'm writing about future quotations i'm not saying uh, i'm not saying this uh, i'm not saying the invoice because it's future quotations potential buyers future because the sale has not yet taken place review the quotations from the potential buyers to confirm the likely sales price of the existing retail park which is underperforming to ensure the accuracy of the 
sales price assumption accuracy of the sales proceed assumption taken by the management taken by the management in calculating the profit on disposal in calculating the profit on disposal look at my procedure number 11 read it out review the quotations from the potential buyers to confirm the likely sale price look at my language future of the existing retail park which is underperforming to ensure the accuracy of the sales proceed assumption taken by the management in calculating the profit so is the sales proceed an important element of the profit determined by the management tell me is sales proceed an important element of the profit calculated by the management can you recalculate the profit on disposal can you discuss with management the basis they took in calculating the profit on disposal so the rest i've already wrote more than the procedures we required but i hope the brainstorming of the procedure is helping you here right now just want to write some student note here before i give you the final answer now listen to this very carefully procedures above and how they meet the definition of professional marks question mark procedures above and how they meet the definition of professional marks number one they are case specific involve calculations where possible involve uh, percentage trends involve uh, cal uh, involve uh, identification of uh, trends like 21.4 percent where possible uh, where possible in revenue uh, skeptical nature skeptical nature like when the new park will be ready skeptical nature like when the new park will be ready skeptical nature why there is a difference of dollar forty thousand in the finance cost i didn't wrote this procedure but we did discuss this procedure right why there is a difference of forty thousand in the finance cost forecasted so skeptical nature right like when the new park will be ready why there is a difference of forty thousand uh you're just taking that skeptical approach you're asking management why is such a significant growth in revenue when a park is underperforming skeptical nature why significant growth in uh, why significant growth in revenue despite an underperforming park so i did exercise that skeptical mindset not just when i was writing but even when i was discussing i must have discussed lots of things which i didn't put down on my answer but i hope you got that when you watch the recording again so i had that skeptical nature i had the percentages i had the calculations i was case specific so that is the definition where i'm fetching the highest number of professional marks for my procedures not just the technical marks uh, is that clear to all of you is that student note important is the demonstration of procedures good for you please confirm so we can take on the last part of the question so on the basis of this you can write more procedures right i've given you more than 10 we just need 10 but look at my procedures they're all starting with action review agree recalculate review analyze discuss am i breaking the rules of the procedure which i told you am i breaking the rules of the procedures every procedure has a action every procedure has a purpose and the best part is they're out of the case study now tell me one last thing if i just make my procedures from exhibit number two and i make no procedure from exhibit number one will that help me fetch professional marks no only technical marks 
Now, this is an important uh, note number. If a student only write procedures from exhibit two and ignore exhibit one and ignore exhibit one, the student will fetch technical marks, but will lose professional marks as the examiner requested to find procedures from both exhibit. So if one student is finding procedures from both exhibit, just like we did in the session today, will it be worthy of professional marks? So are you gaining confidence today on professional marks clarity since the start of the session today? Are you getting better definitions of professionalism? Yes, you can write more procedures from exhibit two and less from exhibit one. That's fine. But you need to find from both. So that's not an issue. How much you write from one and how much you write from two. But at least there should be one single procedure from exhibit one, at least. Right? Is everyone clear with the demonstration of professional marks? Is everyone sound with how I illustrated the professional marks in the requirement A and B? Uh, and are you all sound how you should read and understand? Okay, let's look at the last part and then do a final discussion. Okay, the part C. Let's go back to the case study. Yes, you can write some extra procedures, but again, not at the expense of the time management. Instead of writing 10 procedures, you write 12. Just to be optimistic that the assessor might check the extra one and reward you but not at the expense of the time management. If this question is to end in 36 minutes, you're not taking 40 minutes to write two extra procedures. Is, the, is that clear? Yes, same. You can write, instead of three points, you can write four points. Instead of 10 procedures, you can write 12 procedures, but not at the expense of the time management, which, is, which, is, which will be very bad. Okay, last thing. Back to the case. Okay, which is the last requirement we are left with? The last requirement we are left with is discuss the implication on the assurance report, right? If no revision is made in the forecasted financial statement, four marks. Let's open the exhibit number three for that. Okay, let's see what's happening in the exhibit number three. I hope you can all see the exhibit three on your screen. Please confirm that before I start reading it. Can you see the exhibit three on your screen? <coughs> okay, good. It is now the 5th of August and the engagement procedures have been completed and the assurance report on the forecasted financial statement is due to be issued in next few days. So the report, assurance report is due to be issued in the next few days. Currently, it's the 5th of August. The manager in charge of engagement has concluded that the assumptions over revenue and profit are too optimistic. Did we did we thought of that as well when we were writing procedures that the profit is very significant number uh, considering the park is underperforming? And did we thought 21.4% growth in revenue is too much considering the park is underperforming and the new park is not yet ready? So the auditor is concluding the same. So now look at my procedures matching with exhibit number three. Even though we, we are not looking at exhibit three writing procedures, but the thought process was right. Now this will earn me more professional marks if my thought process matches with the examiner. In exam, you're reading all the three exhibits first, right, before you write the answer. So that would help you eventually because you're reading all exhibits first before you start writing the answer. Okay, so assumptions over revenue and profits are too optimistic. This is what the, uh, the auditor is concluding. The matter has been discussed with management. Have you took the action? Have you already taken the action? The matter has been discussed with management, which is good, right? But they have refused to revise. They have refused to revise as they're concerned that the bank would not approve the loan. Well, stop. Such a bad management, right? They're refusing to adjust. They're just greedy of taking the loan. Now look at the situation of the auditor. Auditor is considering that revenue and profits on disposal are two optimistic assumptions. Discuss the implication on the report the auditor has to think here, four marks. 
So let's let's take them back on my Word file. Uh, closing this exhibit number C, or I can write the answer here right on the platform and then copy it in my Word document for your for you to take a print out of this. Okay. Can you all see the word processor? Is the font size clear on the word processor? Because I'm writing on the word processor, discuss the implications, right? Can you see the font size? Can you see what I'm writing on the uh, word processor with clarity? Okay, let's write the implication for the assurance report. Number one, point number one, how many points I need to write? Four. The assumptions uh, for revenue, the assumptions for revenue growing, the assumptions for revenue and profit on disposal are concluded to be too optimistic. Are concluded to be too optimistic. Are concluded to be too optimistic and are very important and are very important to the forecasted financial statements because any changes because any changes in the revenue and profit number will directly impact the profit of the forecasted profit of the company am i right any adjustment by the management which they are not doing because any changes in the revenue and profit number will directly impact the forecasted profit. So the assumptions for revenue and profit on disposal are concluded to be too optimistic and are very important to the forecasted financial statement because any changes in the revenue and profit number will directly impact the forecasted profit. So the point number one, when you, whenever you're writing an implication, you first need to conclude what is the issue. So this is the issue. Now, in the second point of the implication, you will write, as the management disagree, you are writing a story. You will not just say, the auditor will issue a qualified opinion for a stop. Will you get four marks? Never. The auditor should issue an adverse opinion. Will you get four marks? No. So you need to create the situation. First, you are telling the examiner that this is the conclusion. This is the conclusion in the case. And any changes in revenue and profit are really important for the profit. As the management disagree to adjust, as the management disagree to revise the assumptions, there is a disagreement between the auditor and the management. Uh, disagreement between auditor and management and this will lead to auditor concluding that the two assumptions, two assumptions are unrealistic. We are not saying all assumptions are unrealistic, just the two assumptions are unrealistic. As the management disagree to revise assumptions, there is a disagreement between the auditor and the management, and this will lead to the auditor concluding that the two assumptions are unrealistic. Two assumptions are unrealistic, full stop. Right? Now, full stop, and you write there, you have to be diplomatic. Now, for my regular class students, not for my students who follow me on the social media, for my regular class students who have taken the classes from me, online classes from me, I did a lecture on this, right? And we concluded from the ISAE 3400 that if there are two or more assumptions which are unrealistic, more likely the auditor will issue an adverse opinion. Otherwise, a qualified opinion because that's given in the ISAE 3400. But we need to be diplomatic in exam. We cannot be straightforward in exam. And that's where your judgment comes in. Exercise a careful judgment. So if I need to exercise a careful judgment, I will tell examiner, if the auditor conclude that the two 
assumptions are material for the forecasted financial statements the the un if the auditor concludes that the two assumptions are material for the forecasted financial statements and are not adjusted the auditor will issue a qualified opinion on the forecasted financial statements full stop however if the auditor conclude that the two assumptions are material and pervasive for the forecast prepared by the management for obtaining bank loan then the auditor will auditor will issue a adverse opinion right full stop further whether and qualified whether a qualified or an adverse opinion is issued the auditor will explain in the basis of the opinion paragraph the reason for the issuance of the said opinion whether a qualified or an adverse opinion is issued the auditor will explain in the basis of opinion paragraph the reason for the issuance of the said opinion and the audit and the assurance report due to a qualified opinion or adverse opinion will be modified so it will be a modified assurance report right now how many bullets i have on my screen 1 2 3 4 5 how many bullets we need we need how many bullets four so you can skip one bullet right uh, the bullet number 1 and 2 you can skip the bullet number 2 or you can skip the bullet number 1 but the last three bullets are extremely important so in the exam when you cannot conclude on whether the matter is material or material and pervasive you need to write the diplomatic answer the question is asking for the implication on report right so tell me is opinion part of report or not did i commented on the opinion and did i then commented on the report how can i just comment on the report without the opinion opinion comes first report comes after did i comment here assurance report assurance report due to a qualified opinion and adverse opinion will be modified look at this last line whoever is asking this question look at the last line so opinion will lead to a modified report right so first i need to comment on the opinion then then comes the modified report right how can i just say the report will be modified not telling what opinion will it, will it be no this cannot be included in the other information paragraph such an illogical question what comes in the other information paragraph you are providing an assurance report a separate assurance report right why you people are confusing it with the other information paragraph are we conducting are we are, uh, are, are we performing the audit or are we performing an assurance engagement here we are telling the implication for the assurance report right which is a separate engagement here no there is no connection of this with the audit right examiner is not asking you what what will be the what will the auditor do in the audited financial statement when you conducting the audit of the same company so why stretching your answer there i hope you are clear with this rahul sometime the questions are so illogical that uh, that that for one minute you think that if such sorry if such assumptions are taken in exam you're spoiling your professional marks did i just answered what the examiner asked for tell me rahul and the other student did i just answered what exactly was asked for in the four marks 
was the examiner relating this with the audit of the ongoing financial statement? And do you believe these assumptions and forecasted financial statements are part of the other information? No, this is a separate publication which will go to the bank. They're not part of the other information, right? So I don't know why from where this other information popped in in the mind of some students. Okay, so have I gained my professional marks here? Did I try taking a judgment that whether it is material judgment, whether it is material and pervasive judgment? So I exercised my judgment. Uh, I tried blending my answer with the case and I tried improving the quality threshold, right? So is everyone clear with the structure of the answer we did today? The answer for the question number two. So whatever I wrote on the practice platform, I'm just copying this on my Word file. So everything gets to you. So I'm just copying everything I wrote on the Word file down under my Word file because this file will be saved. And whatever extra I wrote, particularly for the part C, I guess, and I wrote something for the part A as well on the platform. So answer to A, matters to be considered in engagement. Agreeing the terms of engagement, I wrote about scope. I wrote about intended user. I wrote about the management responsibilities. And I wrote, I, I just discussed about deadline fees and assurance level. And you know the reason for that. We did discuss about student one, two, that which student will take most of the professional marks. The first student or the second student, now that was all part of my recording of this webinar. Then we got some information from the case study, which was copy pasted from the exhibit one to write the answer. Then we got to the exhibit two, we need to write procedures. We got some information about exhibit one and two for writing procedures. And then in the exhibit three, we need to write the implication for the report, which I just wrote right over here. Okay, I hope you like the structuring and answering of this question number two from the mock exam. And I hope you must have learned something out of this today and the marking scheme. Now, honestly, tell me before I wrap up the session today, uh, has this exercise of reading, understanding the question two, A, B, C, uh, looking into the exhibit one for the requirement A, looking into exhibit one and two for requirement B, and looking into exhibit C, three for requirement C, ensuring we followed the instructions, <clears throat> Ensuring we followed the instructions of the examiner is part of professional marks. We use the right exhibits for the right requirements. Number one, right? Just let's quickly make a summary of the professional marks inside before I wrap up the session today. because that is something which needs to be reinforced every day. Okay, summary of professional marks in sight from question two. Listen to me very carefully. Number one. Uh, uh, this exam is given in the platform, practice platform under the September 22 exams. When you click on international, under the international, you will find two exams. One exam is applicable for September 22. You open that up and you find this mock exam under, under the practice exams, right? And Mohammed, we wrote both of them, right? Uh, if you have relevance of ISAE 3400, which I covered in my regular classes, and I did upload a lecture on ISAE 3400 as the lecture five on the block four of my portal, where you access lectures as registered students. Uh, the ISAE 3400 mentioned if two or more assumptions are unrealistic, the auditor will think about adverse opinion. But because it was an exam paper, and I need to take a, a careful judgment, so I wrote both that if two assumptions are wrong, auditor can issue a qualified opinion, which is an accept for opinion. 
or if two assumptions are wrong, the order can also considered an adverse opinion, right? So the qualified opinion is known as an except for opinion, right? So if, if the auditor is issuing the qualified opinion in the situation one, the auditor will say, except for the two assumptions, the other are fine. Okay, just let's make a summary of the professional marks and be with me, right, for the next five minutes. And I just want a Q&A session. Uh, when I'm asking a question, you all need to respond. Summary of the professional marks. Number one, I did got my professional marks, number one, because you followed the instructions you followed the instructions of the examiner for which exhibits to use for which requirements. Did we, did we perform that, number one? We followed the instructions which exhibits to use for which requirements, number one. We wrote a case-specific answer. Nothing was out of case. That's number two. Each point was well developed uh, in terms of a paragraph for part A and C. Procedures were related to the case and involve calculations, trends, challenging challenging management assumptions, et cetera. More importantly, the sound judgments for reporting implica report implication was taken in terms of giving examiner both the dimensions, both the dimensions of qualified as well as adverse opinion. So, the opinion, the right opinion, right, is part of your analysis skill and your judgment skill, both. Uh, the procedures were the procedures demonstrated acumen because they were in context of the knowledge given in the case. Realistic procedures, acumen and skepticism. Mostly case specific answers. We followed the instruction of the examiner. So this is this is is the key. It's like the key conclusions. Uh, most of the things done here is increasing the chances that. Somewhere across the question number two, we did demonstrate our professional marks. In total, there were five. So I, I think it will be fair enough to say that the answer I wrote above in the shortage of the time we have in webinars and discussing with students, uh, this answer is worthy of taking somewhere around four professional marks. And I did highlighted areas where professional marks were going in when I was writing the answer. I did highlight them in yellow as well somewhere in my procedures that these are worthy of taking professional marks. Yes, case specific is also commercial acumen right, because that's the know-how of the case. Okay, so that is it. I hope you liked the session today. Can you just give me a quick feedback? Um, the answers and everything will be shared with all of you. So please don't worry about it as I will be sharing for the other days as well. So was it beneficial? Question two, uh, did you got the marking schemes and did you got the right insights into uh, what to do in the question two, right? So please do subscribe to my channel, youtube.com slash Kashif Kamran because that's where the recordings are being uploaded for this webinar. And I hope you're benefiting from this webinar so on and so forth. Uh, Honestly, tell me, have you started to gain confidence on professional marks? Because it's now three days into this webinar. Number one, I would be looking for your answers quickly on that. Secondly, have you got an idea about how to read and write in the, in the word processor or in the briefing note? How to go about copy pasting and rephrasing things uh, into a proper answer? How to structure things up in the answer? Have you got that approach as well?
Okay. And, 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 and is, is this really uh, motivating you at this point in time when you have exams 12 days away and you can still implement them in the questions you're doing at home? Okay. That's great. That's great. So the session, uh, day three is coming to an end. Day four is tomorrow. And day four is looking at the question number three of the mock exam, right? So I hope you will not be missing on that. The question three of the mock exam. That comes tomorrow, question number three, another interesting session where we'll take a final blending of the professional marks, not just the professional marks in question three, but we'll take an overall summary of how to boost your professional marks. I've given you a checklist, right, on the day one, and I'll just try to make another summary of uh, how you ensure taking at least 15 out of 20 professional marks in your real exam. If you're taking a big chunk of professional marks, 15 out of 20, look at the prospects of you passing, uh, you crossing over the 50 marks. So aim for 15 out of 20 professional marks, and that's doable. If you do the calculations, materialities, trends, case-specific answer, exercising judgment, challenging the opinions of the management, challenging the statements of the management, trying to ensure you're writing conclusions wherever necessary, uh, if you are writing an issue, you're writing an action. Uh, if you're writing an ethical issue, you're writing an action. If you're writing a quality control issue, you're writing an action. Uh, try, uh, if you're writing an impact on the report, try to justify the impact on report. Try to make a background of that impact, uh, not just saying this will result in a qualified opinion. That is not a worthy statement. You need, to, you need to put the basis of the qualified opinion. You need to justify why a qualified opinion. Now, again, a long list of such things will come on day four, the summer, uh, the final day, where I'll try to make a holistic analysis of professional marks, not just the question number three. So I'll see you back then for the final day and a final summary coming tomorrow and, and, the, final, <clears throat> and the final tips coming in. Right. So take care of yourself and uh, I wish you all a very best of luck for your upcoming exams, which are now just 12 days away. Any question which was technical and I didn't respond it, please put that on the WhatsApp group. So I will be responding in the next 24 hours because currently I'm just busy with the webinars. So my response rate to questions have gone a bit down uh, and I hope you understand that. But my response rate would start improving. Uh, after I complete the fourth day tomorrow. And even my responses to the assignments would start improving from uh, the conclusion of the fourth day onwards. Thank you so much if you understand this and uh, wish you all the best of luck. And I'll see you back tomorrow for the fourth and final day. This is your tutor, Kashif Kamran, signing off from the day three of the webinar to success for advanced audit and insurance for exams in September 22. Goodbye, take care, and Allah Hafiz, all of you.